Hi, this is the third video I'm doing on the state of inner city train travel in the United States in 2023 and a look at different states of note. And this is a map of what we just looked at, but it shows that there's various densities of service. So the lines that are in red are where the trains run in each direction more than five times a day. And then orange is the second level two to five times a day and blue is just one train in each direction each day and then the light blue thin lines there's a couple of lines for example from new orleans up to los angeles and from indianapolis over to washington dc where the trains only operate three times a week in each direction this is that same map again showing that there's a certain subset of the cities where the trains only arrive in each direction during the middle of the night. So a lot of train stations in the United States are quiet during the day because the trains only arrive during the middle of the night. And there are many cities in this category, surprisingly, Spokane, Washington, Salt Lake City, Lincoln, Nebraska, Little Rock, Arkansas, Indianapolis and Cincinnati and Toledo and Cleveland. And Pittsburgh is right on the cusp of not having service during the day. And then down in the Carolinas, Greenville, South Carolina, and the next couple of stations, the trains only arrive during the middle of the night. And let's not forget about Fargo, North Dakota. So this map shows that across the US, there's 520 stations in 46 out of the 48 lower states, but there's a smaller group of states that actually provide subsidies to Amtrak to help operate the trains in those states. There's only 16 out of the 46 states that do provide subsidies. So this shows the various lines, and you can see California and Oregon and Washington do in the West, and then Illinois does for several lines in the Midwest, as does Missouri and Michigan. All the lines in Michigan are subsidized by the state of Michigan. And in previous videos, we've looked at different states that do the best, I think, in terms of providing inner city service. In one video, I looked at the West, California and Washington in particular, with Oregon, an honorable mention. And then the Midwest, Illinois particularly, and also Michigan, and then Missouri too. So this video is gonna focus on the states in the east, first starting with New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware, and then moving down the coast. Every state on the east coast warrants merit. So going down to the Carolinas, and then the New England states too. The first state in the east that I think does a great job of providing inner city train travel is Pennsylvania. And this map shows the train line that runs east-west through the southern part of Pennsylvania. And there are also little bits of other lines that cut across the corners of the state, up in the northwest and through Erie, through the southwest, down from Pittsburgh, going to Connellsville on the way to Washington, D.C., and in Philadelphia, going northeast towards New Jersey and New York, there's part of the northeast corridor that runs through Pennsylvania. And the main line is the old Pennsylvania Railroad line between Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. So one of the things about Pennsylvania is that they're one of the 16 states that provide subsidies to Amtrak, but they spend less per train than any other state except for Wisconsin, which gives a small amount to Amtrak for a service between Milwaukee and Chicago. Pennsylvania provides subsidy for all the trains that run between Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, but their subsidy per train is kept low because of the high ridership, especially between Philadelphia and Harrisburg, where people 
could do long distance commuting in from points west of Philadelphia into the city. And the service is electrified from Philadelphia to Harrisburg. So they only contribute $3.7 million per year, which is the smallest amount total above Wisconsin, and figures out to $338 per train, which figures out to only 29 cents per year per capita in Pennsylvania. So it's a real small donation, but they don't have to contribute a higher amount because that does it in terms of providing the level of service that they have between Philadelphia and Harrisburg. So this again shows the system and the train line. So you can see from Philadelphia to Harrisburg, there are some straight shots to get to Harrisburg. But then going from Harrisburg to Pittsburgh, going through the mountains of Pennsylvania, it takes a rather circuitous route so that the train takes five and a half hours to get from Harrisburg to Pittsburgh, as opposed to three and a half hours driving or one hour flying. So it's not the quickest route. It would benefit by having more tunnels through the mountains that would give it more of a straight shot. And that goes for any kind of train line that goes through Pennsylvania. If it was to go through Pennsylvania in a fairly short amount of time, you would need to go through tunnels to have straightaways so that the train could really make time. So that's one of the things that's hurt the ability of Pennsylvania to have more train service and and also the fact that a lot of the towns in the northern part of the state aren't that big and scattered far and wide. So I'm going to take you going from Pittsburgh, show you the stations in Pennsylvania. First, we'll look at Pittsburgh, then go down to Connellsville, then go across the state, and then we'll show Erie at the end. So here's Pittsburgh Union Station, which I feature in another video on Pittsburgh train stations past and present. And it's just a beautiful station designed by Daniel Burnham, who designed Chicago Union Station and the Chicago World's Fair, Flatiron Building in New York, really significant architect. So this is a beautiful building, and I encourage you to watch that video to see more of it from the outside, as well as looking through some of the windows into the building itself. It's not mostly a train station now. It's been converted to a condominium called the Pennsylvania, and Amtrak is relegated to one corner of the basement, which I show in that video. This just shows you the grandness of this former train station versus it has a garage, an Amtrak garage now that hardly anybody parks in, but this is kind of representative of the level of the train station today. So let's look at the train stations in Pennsylvania. Here's McConnellsville going down to Washington, D.C. on the one line, and then going east towards Harrisburg and Philadelphia. This is the first station is Greensburg, very attractive station. Latrobe, Pennsylvania, home of Arnold Palmer. Johnstown, Pennsylvania. I don't know whether this station was here before their horrific flood that they had, but it's a station that's there. Altoona, which probably once had an attractive historic station, but now has a modern, almost brutalist style station, not owned by Amtrak, by the way. Then Tyrone. Tyrone and Altoona are the two closest stations to State College where Penn State University is in case people want to take the train. They have to first get down to the rail line, and this is one of the closest stations. And then further east, Huntington. So they use a small shelter now. This was the former station building at Huntington. And Lewistown. And then Harrisburg. So here's the outside of the station, and it still has a train shed. And here's a shot of the interior of Harrisburg. Then going east, Middletown has a modern station that was built by PennDOT using a contractor from Lancaster. Elizabethtown, attractive stone station with a suburban style platform and canopy, high level platform. Mount Joy, and you'll notice that these stations going east from Harrisburg to Philadelphia, it's in electrified territory, so they have overhead catenary wires, also high-level platform. Then Lancaster is actually busier number of passengers per day than Harrisburg. It's the busiest station in Pennsylvania outside of Philadelphia, and it has a modern glass port cocher where you can pull up, be protected from the rain in front of the main entrance to Lancaster. There's a train in the station. 
here's the interior at Lancaster. Then Lancaster is the main town in Pennsylvania Dutch country, and Parksburg is also in Pennsylvania Dutch country. It looks like an Amish man standing next to the shelter. There's a nice, attractive station house. Then Coatesville looks like a station that had a more glorious past. This is what the station used to look like when it first opened, and it was really quite a production with this nice road driveway that you could drive on and then go through a tunnel underneath the tracks over to the station house. I don't know if that tunnel is still open. Here's another shot at Coatesville. I couldn't tell from the pictures whether that tunnel is still there. You can drive through. Downingtown, which does have a pedestrian tunnel underneath the tracks. And then Exton, as we're getting closer to Philadelphia now, with a new canopy and station building. And Paoli. All these stations, for the most part, these stations have high-level platforms. And then Ardmore, there used to be a station house here. They've been fixing this station up. I don't know if they're building a new type station house here, but the one that they demolished was not very attractive. So they're making improvements here at Ardmore. And then Philadelphia, 30th Street Station, beautiful station, which I also included in my video of the most attractive train stations in the U.S. And on the Northeast Corridor, this is North Philadelphia. And this was the original station house being used for something else now, but I thought it was attractive. And then Cornwell's Heights is a stop in Bucks County on the way to Trenton on the Northeast Corridor. Then, as I was mentioning, Erie, Pennsylvania, way up in the northwestern corner on a different line, has a station. There's the exterior of the Erie Station. So as you can see, a lot of Pennsylvania doesn't have train service anymore. It did. It used to have trains crisscrossing all over the place throughout Pennsylvania, including the northern part of Pennsylvania. And I'm going to feature Scranton as a one city in particular that has a beautiful former train station, former Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western Rail Station designed by Kenneth McKenzie Murchison who also designed the Hoboken Station and Baltimore Penn Station, beautiful stations, both of them. And this station opened in 1908, and it was operating up until 1970, and now it's a hotel. And see, it's a beautiful building in the French Renaissance style, and you can stay here at the hotel. I think they do pretty good business, and they charge more than $300 a night, what I saw. Let's move on to New York. New York's another state that subsidizes Amtrak. It provides the fourth most in subsidies behind California is number one, then Illinois, then Michigan, then New York. And New York's another case where due to the high ridership, they don't have to provide as high a subsidy per train as many other states. So New York, they're only number 12 in terms of subsidies per train. They're 13 in terms of subsidies per capita. So they subsidize to the tune of about $1,700 a train. But a lot of that's for one particular train line that goes from New York to Toronto, across upstate New York. The subsidies are much lower for the trains that run between Albany and New York, which is the bulk of the train service in New York State, outside of the New York metropolitan area. So this just shows the different lines. And again, we're going to start from the west and move east and then go down the Hudson, and then I'll also show you the train stations going up the Hudson and along Lake Champlain in New York State all the way to the Canadian border. So I wanted to start off with Rochester, even though it's not the westernmost city in New York served by Amtrak, but I thought it was an attractive station with an attractive interior, fairly new station. A lot of the stations along the east-west route in New York are newer they replaced older stations but some of the older stations that are still there are just beautiful so this is rochester and then this is looking across at the high level platforms all right now we'll go for all the way to the west to niagara falls which has a new station as does buffalo the exchange street station just opened in 2020 here's another view of it you can see where it's situated. It's not the most optimal location with highways overhead zipping by. You can see where it is on the map. The highways 
were allowed to be built right through Buffalo, unfortunately. So the train has to drive underneath the streets and highways. So it's kind of in the dark here. And this is Buffalo's former station. What a station. Art Deco powerhouse designed by Fellheimer and Wagner, who also designed the Cincinnati Union Station, which is my number one most attractive station in the country. I don't know where I'd put Buffalo if this station was still in operation because it has a lot of the similar Art Deco design elements, but it's still standing and I think they're using part of it. And then this station actually gets more ridership for Buffalo than the previous station, the Buffalo Depew Station, and it's one of those Dollar General style stations that I'm not very fond of. So this is east of the downtown. And then going further east to Syracuse has a more modern station. I'm not swept away by the style. And then Rome has one of the older stations, Rome, New York. There's the interior at Rome. And then Utica, New York, was also designed by Fellheimer. He worked with different architects, so I don't know if this was Fellheimer and Wagner, but it's a very significant station for a smaller city, still on the city side. And this is the marble interior, very Italian, and the outside of the Rome station with an old steam locomotive on display there. And then Amsterdam, New York, has nothing Dutch about it. it. Looks like it's off in the middle of nowhere on the way to Albany. And then the next town, Schenectady, used to have this terrible looking station built in the 70s or maybe 80s. And fortunately, it was demolished and replaced with this nice new station opened in 2018. So they have a modern station in Schenectady, and so does Albany. Very attractive station. It's the eighth busiest station in the country, Albany. And here's a train at one of the platforms. So now we'll go down the Hudson. And the next step is the attractive station of Hudson, which was built in the 1870s. And it's the oldest continuously operating train station in the U.S., I believe, at least in New York, a platform at Hudson. And then the next station south is Rhinecliff. Now, you can live in Hudson or Rhinecliff and commute into New York City, and people do. Not a ton of people, but both of these stations get a fair amount of ridership. And Rhinecliff is in a beautiful location right on the Hudson River. So just looking down at the platform. And then the next town is Poughkeepsie, which is the start of the Metro North system. So most people will take Metro North into the city, but if you're commuting in from further out, you're on Amtrak, and you probably stay on Amtrak going all the way into the city. But you could switch to the MTA, Metro North, if you wanted to. And you can see in the background here, it's just looking north. That's an old railroad bridge that went across the Hudson, and now it's a pedestrian trail that a lot of people use. It gives you great views up and down the Hudson at Poughkeepsie. Then the next station down that Amtrak stops at is Croton Harmon. And in between there are other Metro North stations between Poughkeepsie and Croton, all attractive. So Amtrak stops here also. So if you live in Westchester County where Croton Harmon is, which is a major county just north of New York City, and you don't want to go into the city to catch Amtrak, you can come here to Croton Harmon and they have a large parking lot you can use. You could do the same thing by going to Yonkers, which is also in Westchester County, but they don't have much parking there. But it's a very attractive station designed by Warren and Wetmore, 1911 Beaux-Arts style. And then New York City, Penn Moynihan. On the schedules, they refer to it as the Moynihan Train Hall. So it's the only station in the country that is called a hall, but it's part of Penn Station. It's the new addition, just opened up a year or two ago. It's much more attractive than what Amtrak passengers used across the street, across 8th Avenue, underneath Madison Square Garden. So then one other station in the New York area, it's also a Metro North station, but Amtrak stops at it also is New Rochelle, which has a good-sized downtown with high-rise buildings, 40 stories, 50 stories tall nearby New Rochelle. And now we'll go back north of Albany to show you the stations going up to the Canadian border, starting with Saratoga Springs and then Fort Edward, Whitehall, Ticonderoga, which just is a very modest shelter there. 
and it's only single track service now going north toward Henry. And you'll notice from here going north, a lot of the towns have something to do with port or being on the water. West Port is the next station north. So if you're from New York, this is a way for you to see all the stations you could go to in your own state. Port Kent, another town with port in its name. I think Port Kent has the lowest ridership of any station in New York State, but it's a seasonal thing. But what a location right on Lake Champlain. You can see Vermont across the lake. Plattsburgh, the biggest station up north and the biggest town. Rouse's Point, right at the top of Lake Champlain, just south of the Canadian border. And then the, the trains were going to Montreal up until COVID, and I believe they're being reinstituted in 2023. So there again is the whole system in New York State. And again, the trains don't go everywhere in the state, but one place of significance they used to go to that has a beautiful station is in Binghamton, another Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western Station, like the one in Scranton. And this was built in 1901, Italian Renaissance, and Richardsonian Romanesque. And it'd be just great somehow if service was brought back to Binghamton. It's the home of one of the major campuses of the State University of New York. So it'd be great if the students had this option of going to and from school. Many of the students are from the New York area, so their options are more limited without train service. And just to show you that the upstate train service is not the only game in town, this is the MTA, Metropolitan Transportation Authority network, that is very extensive. The Long Island Railroad on Long Island, Metro North goes north of the city on both sides of the Hudson, and, and the western line goes to Port Jervis, which I feature in a video on just Port Jervis, as well as its neighbor, Otisville. I've covered all the stations on that line in a separate videos. And I've also covered a couple of the stations north of the city that are the major stations of Metro North. I included Croton Harmon, but also White Plains and Stamford, Connecticut in a single video. So let's go now to New Jersey. Now, New Jersey doesn't have many stations that Amtrak serves, but it's on the Northeast Corridor. So the stations that it does serve have high ridership compared to stations across the country. And I cover New Jersey in a series of videos on the New Jersey transit system. So I've been to every train station in this in the system, 150 odd stations, and there's another more than 50 stations of three different light rail lines, including one that I show in the map on the right, where I mainly am showing that Amtrak used to go to Atlantic City, and then so does New Jersey Transit. And so Amtrak pulled out and no longer goes to Atlantic City, but you can still take Amtrak to Philadelphia and then switch to New Jersey Transit and still take the train to Atlantic City. And then the other line on the map on the right is a one of the light rail lines that acts as kind of an interurban, and it goes between Camden, right across from Philadelphia, up to Trent. So New Jersey's really well served by train service and has many beautiful stations. So if you're interested in the New Jersey train system, I've got you covered. I've got a video on it that includes every one of these stations. So let's move on to Delaware. And there's only a couple stations in Delaware, and Delaware does not have to provide any subsidies to Amtrak because of the high ridership that the, the Northeast Corridor line makes money for Amtrak, so no subsidies are needed. Same thing with New Jersey. New Jersey doesn't provide subsidies to Amtrak either. They don't have to. Both states provide Amtrak. They provide riders who buy tickets, so that supports Amtrak that way. So I'll show you the few stations in Delaware. And as you can see, it just cuts across the northern part of the state. So it doesn't go down to the beach like Rehoboth it used to, or it doesn't go to the state capital of Dover. But Wilmington, Delaware, and this station is where Joe Biden commuted into Washington, D.C. every day. He would go back home in Wilmington every night, and they've renamed this station after him. And it's an attractive station, very busy, 16th busiest in the U.S., 
right behind Sacramento. And then the only other station that Amtrak stops at in Delaware is where the University of Delaware is located in Newark, Delaware, not to be confused with Newark, New Jersey. So as I mentioned, there's a couple of places that the trains used to go to. So if you wanted to have more comprehensive service in your state, these are the places you would focus on, Dover and Rehoboth. And here's the former station house in Rehoboth Beach. Okay, now we're going to look at the states south of Delaware, starting with Maryland. Now, Maryland's another state that does not have to provide subsidies to Amtrak, because again, the ridership on the Northeast Corridor pays for itself, as well as helps support the system across the country. And this shows you Maryland gets very busy because the states are smaller and close together. So again, Maryland is like Delaware, just has a few stations on the Northeast Corridor to Washington, D.C. But there's also another line that comes out of Washington, D.C. and stops in two towns in Maryland on its way to Chicago. And those stations are Rockville and Cumberland. So I'll show you the stations here in Maryland, starting with Baltimore Penn Station. Looks a lot like Scranton, Pennsylvania, doesn't it? Designed by the same architect, Kenneth McKenzie Murchison. Beautiful jewel box. And here's the track level. And it's also served by Mark, Maryland Area Regional. The next station, very busy, BWI Airport Station, 14th busiest. Cumberland, Maryland is one of the stations way out west. And this is the old historic station. And I think the previous picture is of a shelter right at the end of this. But Amtrak doesn't use this as the station. They use that other kind of lousy looking shelter. But this is used by the Western Maryland Scenic Railway. So I don't know why Amtrak doesn't use this station. So back in the uh, Washington, D.C. metropolitan area, there are a couple of stations. This one's on the northeast corridor, New Carrollton. And then Rockville is on the line that is going towards Chicago. And it's a big station for WMATA, Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority. So it's mostly a suburban station, but Amtrak does stop here also. And then last, and I'll have to say least, Aberdeen, Maryland. And the station is just a blah looking station north of Baltimore on the Northeast Corridor. But then there's also Washington, D.C. Union Station, second busiest in the U.S. It's right up there in my top three of the most attractive train stations in the U.S. It's just a beautiful station. Also designed by Daniel Burnham, who designed Pittsburgh Union Station. So it's a very significant station. It's right close to the U.S. Capitol. It's very convenient. It's heavily used. It has a lot of restaurants and stores inside. They've redone it inside to bring it back to life. But a lot of the restaurants and stores I've read are empty now due to the COVID. But hopefully it'll come back over time. Just a great place. It's the kind of station where when I've used it, I haven't wanted to leave. It's like I'd rather just soak up the ambiance of the station rather than get on a train. Just really top rate. Okay, so let's move on further south to Virginia. Now, Virginia does provide a subsidy, about the same amount that Pennsylvania does, but they spend more per train because the ridership is lower than in Pennsylvania. So they spend about $900 per train on various lines. That's what it averages out to. So here's the map of Virginia, where it sits in the whole region. You can see it's got pretty good coverage. Not too many cities that it doesn't go to. And again, here's uh, the different lines coming down. The one thing I would say is... It would be nice if there were some connections between these lines, either from Lynchburg or Charlottesville over east to Richmond or Petersburg, something to make it a comprehensive network so that there'd be more intrastate travel. I think it would benefit the ridership on all the lines if there was some more interconnectivity. Otherwise, if you were in Norfolk, for example, and you wanted to go to Roanoke, if you wanted to really stay on that train, you'd have to go up to Washington, D.C. and then get on another line and come back down south. So it'd be nice to have more direct connections. So I'll show you all the stations here in Virginia, starting with Richmond's beautiful Main Street Station, Renaissance Revival, opened in 1901. And this is actually, it's sort of like the case with Buffalo. The station that's outside of the downtown area is actually the busier of the two stations. So this is the Richmond Staples Mill Road Station. So now we're going to go north up to Washington, D.C. This next stop is Ashland. 
and now we're going to go over to the east just to show you the stations over on the Chesapeake Bay near the Atlantic. Norfolk has a new station and this is the station in Newport News, kind of modern and not my particular style or color combination, but it's being replaced with this spectacular new station that is supposed to open in 2023. So it's really dramatic. This is probably the single most exciting new station to open in the US 2023, Newport News. And then we'll go back west, Petersburg, famous Civil War battle fought Petersburg. Williamsburg, which a lot of people know. This is coming up from Newport News. So there's a lot of things to see in the Williamsburg area. Colonial Williamsburg. Fredericksburg. This is way up closer to Washington, D.C. Danville, way down by the North Carolina border. We're going to come up north, coming up from Danville. Clifton Forge is another line coming from the west that goes into West Virginia. So it's near the West Virginia border. Staunton, another town in Western Virginia as we come east to Charlottesville, where the lines meet, and going north back up towards D.C., Culpeper, which I believe might only have one P in the name. I might have put too many P's there. Manassas, also site of a famous Civil War battle. Burke Center, which is a suburban-style station. It's also served by the Virginia Railway Express, which is the commuter train system in Virginia, an up-and-coming system in Alexandria, just south of Washington, D.C. And then going back down south, from Washington, D.C. There's Woodbridge, Quantico, where the major military base is. And then we skipped over Lynchburg, which is in the southern part of the state. Very attractive station with a very high shelter portico above the waiting area by the tracks. And then Roanoke has no station house. It once did, and they've extended service fairly recently to Roanoke. So they've got the station there, and I don't know what the plans are to build a structure that people can wait in and they have a scenic railroad that goes through Roanoke and this was taken in 2017 so they were building the platform you could see the new ties being laid down and formwork for the platform that was built that was shown in the previous picture and then the last station I'm showing in Virginia is a auto train station in Lort Virginia which is just south of Washington DC so a lot of people use this very heavily used service people put their cars on the train and at Lorton and then they go south to Florida and it seems like such a popular service that you would think they would have auto trains in other parts of the country especially in California if people don't want to do all that driving just put their car on a train I think it might be profitable but for whatever reason this is the only auto train line and it's on the eastern seaboard so now we'll look at West Virginia and I started it off with a little station in Prince, West Virginia, just because I thought it was such an attractive little canopy roof with a curved sign. So West Virginia doesn't provide subsidies to Amtrak, and they don't have terrific amounts of riders. But I just thought for a state its size, and maybe by virtue of its location, it gets a fair amount of Amtrak service. So and it's one of the parts of the country where the trains don't arrive in the middle of the night. They actually arrive during the day. So you get some pluses for West Virginia. And there aren't that many stations in West Virginia, so we'll go through this quickly. There's the one line through the southern part of the state where the trains only operate three days a week in each direction. So this is the same line, the line I'm referring to that goes through Charleston and Huntington, West Virginia. It goes to Cincinnati and Indianapolis on its way to Chicago. And at Cincinnati and Indianapolis, the trains stop there in the middle of the night. But here, at least they stop during the day. And then there's the one other line at the top part of the state that cuts through on its way from Washington, D.C. to Pittsburgh. So we'll start off by looking at Martinsburg in the northern part of the state. It's the busiest station in West Virginia. You could do commuting here into Washington, D.C. from Martinsburg. So that's probably why their numbers are higher. And Harper's Ferry is a little closer in to Washington, D.C., but there's not much of anywhere to park, but it's a very scenic location. Harper's Ferry is very scenic overall. And here's an overhead view of Harper's Ferry. And I believe both rail bridges are in operation, but I know you can walk over one. People do. Maybe you're not supposed to, but if there are no trains coming, it's an interesting way to cross the river there. And I'll show you where the station right here, right as you get across the 
one bridge. There's the station in Harpers Ferry. And then Charleston is the state capital. This is their station. Huntington, West Virginia, which is a decent sized town, doesn't have much of a station though. It's got one of those Dollar General stations. Montgomery is going east from Charleston. We'll look at some really lightly used stations, but God bless them, these towns have these stations. You can take the train to these small towns in West Virginia. The next one is Thurman, which is, I think, the most lightly used station in West Virginia and maybe one of the most lightly used in the whole country. But they have a little station house there. They have service. I think the main draw there is to go to a national forest from Thurman. And then the station that I showed right at the start, Prince, they had a station that was built in the 1940s, 1950s. And the design firm, one of the partners of the design firm was the son of James Garfield, the president in the late 1800s. So his son was an architect, one of his sons. And here's the interior at Prince. And then the little town of Hinton also has a station, very cute. And so does Alderson. And then the last station I'll show here in West Virginia is White Sulphur Springs. All right, so let's move on to North Carolina. We'll cover the two Carolinas before we go back northeast. And the first thing I wanted to show with North Carolina, which also does provide subsidies to Amtrak, about $8 million per year, which figures out to an average $2,800 per train, so they're right in the middle of the states that do provide subsidies, is that they own the train line that goes from Moorhead City going west, northwest, up to Raleigh, Durham, and Greensboro, and then down south to Charlotte. So it's pretty good that a state actually owns the right-of-way. And this was done a long time ago, so it was very forward thinking of the early founders of North Carolina to have their own state-owned railway, which Amtrak uses. Not the whole length of the railroad, but most of it. So this shows you a good semblance of a network in North Carolina with connectivity between the lines. So good for North Carolina. There's some town that I've put boxes around that don't receive service. I'd rather focus on the places that do have service, but I just did want to mention that you can't take the train to Warhead City or Wilmington on the Atlantic Ocean. You used to be able to, but this passenger service currently doesn't go there. But North Carolina is a fast-growing state, so that could possibly happen in the future. Service could be reinstituted. And then out west, the city that gets a lot of coverage these days, Asheville, also the train does not go there. It used to, and it may again, but it doesn't currently. But the middle part of the state has good coverage. So let's look at the stations of North Carolina, starting with probably the least attractive station I'll show you in the entire state, Gastonia, which is on the border of South Carolina. So let's go north from Gastonia up to Charlotte. Actually, when you go from Gastonia to Charlotte, you're going east-west. So we're going gone east to Charlotte, which is a modern station. Kannapolis, next station north of Charlotte. Salisbury, which is a very attractive looking station. High Point, and Greensboro also has an attractive station. Another station that the architect Fellheimer contributed to the design. Here's the interior at Greensboro. Now we're going east across the intrastate line, connects the different lines. This is Burlington, very significant looking building. Durham home of Duke University. And now we're in the Raleigh area, so I switched the colors to NC State, North Carolina State, and Cary. A lot of people are moving to or wanting to move to very attractive suburb of Raleigh. And then Raleigh has a beautiful new station, and I'll take you through some pictures of Raleigh because it's very interesting. And I feature this also in my video about the most attractive train stations in the U.S., pointing out that I, I like the old historical stations, but I thought they really did a nice job in Raleigh. And I thought this interior area was just really interesting. 
And two things to note in this picture of the platform, train at the platform, one is that people take their bikes on the train, which I think is a great idea. And then the name of the car here is the Sweet Potato. I thought that was pretty funny. So let's keep going east. And Selma is an interesting station. If you can see in this picture, it has service on perpendicular tracks because it's at the connection point between the line that goes to Raleigh and the main north-south line that goes north up to Richmond and Washington, D.C., further north and down south to Florida. So this station is right there at the intersection of the two train tracks. So they have to obey traffic signals just like cars and trucks do. But it has platforms, one going north-south and one going east-west at Selma. And there's where Selma is right at that connection point. Then Wilson is north of Selma and Rocky Mount, which looks like it has an older building that's been fixed up. And then going south, there's one station going south before you go to South Carolina, Fayetteville, on the line that goes to Florida. And then uh, the other line coming south from Raleigh and Cary going to Columbia, South Carolina. This is Southern Pines, North Carolina, and it looks attractive at night as well. And then the last station I thought was really an attractive station in Hamlet. It looks like a newer building, but built in a historical style. Really unique. Hamlet, North Carolina. Okay, now we're going to go to our last state in the South, South Carolina, which does not provide subsidies to Amtrak, but it's just in a good location between a state that does have a very active system in North Carolina and then states further south, which have less of a rail presence. So South Carolina has pretty good coverage. It has three different lines that go through the state. And the stations on the western part of the state, Clemson and Greenville and Spartanburg, the trains only stop during the middle of the night, unfortunately. And here's the overall layout. And as I was mentioning with North Carolina, it would benefit if they had some connectivity between their major cities, for example, Greenville to Columbia and Columbia to Charleston within the state. That would really make South Carolina a really good state, just the same way having connectivity would help Virginia. If they would both sort of replicate what's been done in North Carolina, I think it really would benefit the ridership on all the lines. So let's look through the stations of South Carolina, starting with Clemson, which has an attractive station right on or next to the Clemson University campus. And then Greenville, which has a very attractive downtown area, which I feature in its own separate video, has this more modern looking train station. Not what I would have expected in Greenville, but the trains only stop here during the middle of the night. So possibly with more service, especially if they connect the cities, Greenville will have service during the day, which would be a definite plus for Greenville. And then Spartanburg going north from Greenville. And then let's go to the north-south line on the eastern part of the state, starting with Dillon, which is just south of North Carolina. And then King Street, where one of my new favorite artists that I've come to appreciate much later in life is Teddy Pendergrass is from King Street. And then North Charleston is the station that serves the Charleston area. And then Umassi, I had to look that up, how to pronounce that to make sure I got the pronunciation correct, is on the train route that goes from Charleston down to Florida. And I include Savannah, Georgia here. It's right on the South Carolina, Georgia border. There's not much to report on the state of Georgia, so I'm including Savannah here with South Carolina. And then Florence is further back north. I skipped over that. I meant to include that between Dillon and King Street. And then three other stations on the center line that runs through the state. Denmark. And when I was looking at the map of South Carolina, there's Denmark, South Carolina, Norway, and Sweden. So they've got their Scandinavian countries covered by the names of towns. I didn't see a Finland, South Carolina, but maybe there's a little one. And then here's the state capital of Columbia, and then Camden, not to be confused with Camden, New Jersey, Camden, South Carolina. So there's South Carolina. Okay, now we're going to cover the Northeast U.S., 
very good coverage in New England and one of my favorite states in general and in terms of supporting Amtrak is Vermont. They've really gone the extra mile in Vermont. So for a small state, it has good train coverage. And this map, which was made just a couple years ago, doesn't even include the latest service, which is this line that now goes from Rutland up to Burlington. Because Burlington didn't have service before. It once did, and then it did in more modern times, but now it does again. So I'll show that. So much kudos to Vermont. Little Vermont provides $4.6 million a year to Amtrak, which averages out to a subsidy of $3,767 per train. So they're really supporting an alternative to driving in Vermont, but that's in keeping with the high regard for the environment they support. So another thing about Vermont, it has more stations per capita than any other state. So that's something. And then they also lost more riders percentage-wise than any other state. The ridership dropped by almost 60% due to COVID. So hopefully that will come back. And this shows the lines that wind their way through the state coming up from New York and from Springfield, Massachusetts, which I'll talk more about a little later on. And then this shows you the new line that has opened where there are three new stations along this line up to Burlington. So let's start off. So let's start off at the southern part of the state, Brattleboro, very attractive town. And they are getting a new high level platform built at Brattleboro, which will be their first station with a high level platform. And then Bellows Falls, which I've been to, very cute town. Most towns in Vermont are cute. So this is right on the Connecticut River that runs down between New Hampshire and Vermont. So they have service at Bellows Falls. They also have an antique train that operates out of Bellows Falls. And I include Claremont, New Hampshire. It's on the same line going north of Bellows Falls. And it's on the other side of the Connecticut River. And then we're back onto the Vermont side of the river at Windsor. You'll see later on, there's a couple of places in Connecticut named Windsor. So it's a popular name in the Northeast, attractive station. And then White River Junction, where they have a antique three-car train underneath a shelter there at the station. Very unique. That's Vermont for you. And then Randolph. We're heading north to the state capital of Montpelier. I think the station is actually in Berlin, Vermont, but it's right next to Montpelier. And then Waterbury, which is not too far away from Montpelier attractive station. Essex Junction, which does not have an attractive station. I don't know if it ever was attractive. To, that's what they have now. And you look at the tracks, I mean, grass is growing up through the tracks. It almost looks like it's not a line that's still used, but it is. And then St. Albans, I wanted to show first what they used to have when trains were the thing back in the day and what a beautiful station they used to have. And this is all they have now, just a little old brick building. All right, so let's go back down south. Coming over from New York State, the first town in New York State, one of the stations I showed previously was Whitehall. So this is Castleton, Vermont. Unique sized building. That's one thing about Vermont. You're not going to get cookie cutter in Vermont. Every station's going to look different. And this is the more modern style station at Rutland. It's right in the downtown area, which has an attractive downtown that is a prime town for revitalization. I'll just say that there's a lot of beautiful architecture in Rutland. So this station is now seeing more service. It used to be the end of the line, but now the line goes further north up to Middlebury, which is the home of Middlebury College. So it's great that the students there at Middlebury can use this station now to get where they need to go, especially to New York from here and also up to Burlington. It's great that they have that option. Attractive new station. And then also at Ferrisburg, Virgin, brought back to life in 2022. So this is the one new line in the country recently in the last couple of years. And then this station was brought back to life in Burlington. It's great that this is now operating as a train station and it's other things too, but the train stops behind the station. So it's great that Burlington now has service again. It's the largest city in Vermont, so it should have train service. And here's the platform. 
at Burlington. This is what it used to look like back in the day. So it isn't what it used to be, but it's still great that the building is still being used in one way, shape, or form. Okay, an equally impressive state, and they all will be in New England, is Massachusetts. And they have what looks like a network. They've got a east-west line that intersects with a north-south line in two different locations. And the train doesn't go everywhere in Massachusetts, but it goes to a lot of places, so that's great. So this shows the different lines. It doesn't go to Cape Cod. It would be nice. I don't know how far in Cape Cod the train used to go. I mean, could it have gone all the way to Provincetown once upon a time? I don't know. But since it's such a popular destination, it would be great if the trains did go to Cape Cod again. It's not a fun drive in the summer to go to Cape Cod because it has a big bottleneck to get on the Cape. We'll start off on the western side of Massachusetts and work east. So Pittsfield has an impressive new station. And then Springfield, Massachusetts, designed by the same architect that designed Boston South Station, opened in 1910. And here's the interior at Springfield and a view of the platform. And Springfield is a, a nexus of train service north, south, and east, west. So it's quite the hub in southern Massachusetts near the Connecticut border on the western part of the state. So going north from Springfield is Holyoke, which is the home of Holyoke College, as well as other nearby schools. Same thing with Northampton. It's an attractive station with a, an attractive downtown area. Very nice town, Northampton. And then the final station heading north up to Vermont is Greenfield, which has this modern station and another view. All right, now we're going to go east from Springfield towards Boston. First station is this very attractive station. It made my honorable mention of my most attractive stations in the U.S. here at Worcester. And then Framingham is a suburban style station served primarily by the MBTA, Massachusetts Bay Transit Authority. But Amtrak also stops here at Framingham in the western suburbs of Boston. And then Boston has three stations in the city itself. This is Back Bay Station, heavily used for Amtrak and for MBTA. And if you can see in the picture to the left, the tall building, the Hancock building, I used to work in that building. I'd come up to Boston from the New York area, work in that building, and then take Amtrak back down to Stanford, where I parked my car, Stanford, Connecticut. And then South Station is a neoclassical powerhouse in Boston, beautiful station, opened in 1899. And then North Station is the other main downtown station, and you can take the trains north from North Station up to New Hampshire and Maine. So I've put the colors of the Boston Celtics and the Boston Bruins because Boston Garden is located above North Station. So as you go north, Woburn is a primarily a suburban station, but Amtrak also stops here. Attractive. And then getting almost up to the New Hampshire border is the town of Haverhill. And in this picture, it's one of the purple MBTA commuter trains. And then going south from Boston is the Boston Route 128 station. It has a very large parking garage, so it's a big station for commuters and for Amtrak. Okay, before we go up to New Hampshire and Maine, I'm first going to show you the southern New England states. And this won't take long for Rhode Island because there's just a couple stations in Rhode Island. And Massachusetts does provide a subsidy to Amtrak, almost $5 million a year, but it only figures out to $850 per train or $0.71 cents per capita. And Rhode Island doesn't provide a subsidy to Amtrak. Again, they're on the Northeast Corridor. They don't have to provide greater service. They already get great service in Rhode Island coming down from Boston, between Boston and New York. So this just shows you that we'll be looking at three stops in Rhode Island. We'll be looking at Providence, Kingston, and Westerly. So this is station in Providence. It's a modern station owned by Amtrak, right next to the state capitol. So it's right in the downtown area, not smack dab in the middle of the downtown, but just north of the major part of the downtown. Easy to walk to from the Brown University campus or other parts of downtown Providence. 
and there's a view of it. I believe this is looking south in the residential area in the background is the area near Brown University. So going south, Kingston, Rhode Island, it's the home of the University of Rhode Island, and they have a high-level platform here. And this is westerly Rhode Island, right near the border of Connecticut. And it's a town sort of like Rhinebeck and Hudson, New York, possible town to live in if you wanted to commute either to Boston or to New York a couple of days a week. It gets great service. I mean, for a town that only has a population of around 25,000, it gets 20 trains per day, more than. So great service. It's an attractive looking station from the train and just really good setup in westerly Rhode Island. All right, let's look at Connecticut. And this shows a picture of a Acela train pulling into New London. So Connecticut also has what I would describe as a network. It has an east-west line and a north-south line. And the main connection point is New Haven. And the line that runs along Long Island Sound is as of many attractive viewpoints as you look out the train. So you want to sit on the side of the train facing the water to get those views. So let's keep going west. We were in westerly Rhode Island, which you see on the map right across the border in Rhode Island. So the first stop in Connecticut is Mystic, where the movie Mystic Pizza was filmed. And then New London, Connecticut has a very significant station. I think it was one of the last buildings designed by the famous architect H.H. H. Richardson, Henry Hobson Richardson, who was from Brookline right next to Boston. And I believe he passed away before the station construction was completed. But you hear about Richardsonian Romanesque style architecture. Well, here's the man, H.H. H. Richardson, who started that. And it's characterized by a heavy look with the use of arches. And I think it's a really interesting architectural style. I never get tired of Romanesque style architecture built primarily in the late 1880s and early 1890s. And here's another great shot of New London. It shows the ferries that go out to Block Island, which is in Rhode Island from Connecticut. You can take the train here and then switch to a ferry if you want to. And then going west, there's Old Saybrook, the station house, and the platform with an overhead walkway. And these stations east of New Haven are also served by the Shoreline East Connecticut state-supported railroad. So Amtrak and Shoreline East, they really give these towns great train service. There's no excuse for not taking the train in Connecticut. And then this is a station designed by a famous New York City architect, Cass Gilbert, opened in 1920, Union Station at New Haven. And then Bridgeport has a modern station now. So Bridgeport, unfortunately, does not have a historical type train station. I don't know what it used to look like, but I'm sure it was attractive. But this is what they have now. And then Stamford also has a modern train station. And it's the most heavily used commuter station on the Metro North system outside of Grand Central in New York. So it's a very busy station. And it has a good-sized parking garage that you can park at and take the train either up to Boston, like I once did, or take the train into the city, New York City. So let's go back to New Haven, and we're going to look at the stations going north out of New Haven. So this is the new station of State Street Station, which is right close to Union Station. So plenty of options to take the train in New Haven. Then going north, Wallingford, Meriden which is owned by Connecticut DOT, opened in 2017. And Berlin, Connecticut looks like the same vintage. So there's a Berlin, Connecticut, there's a Berlin, Vermont. So a lot of the New England states have towns, same names. And then Hartford's Union Station, also designed in that Romanesque, Richardsonian Romanesque style, and opened in 1889. And the architect for this was the same as South Station in Boston. And there's a view of the train with the Connecticut State Capitol building in the background. And then going north up to Massachusetts is Windsor. And then they're getting a new station at Windsor Locks. So keep an eye out for that when that appears. Okay, the final state I'm going to show is Maine. And Maine provides a subsidy 
along with New Hampshire. Together, they give a subsidy to Amtrak of $5.6 million a year, which figures out to about $1,500 per train for the Downeaster train that runs between Portland, Maine, and Boston. So both states are supporting Amtrak. It's just shows you how the train comes up from Boston, cutting right through the southeastern part of New Hampshire up to Maine. And as you can see, the train doesn't go very far into Maine, but it does go to the major city of Portland, as well as other decent-sized towns on the Atlantic coast, so really good for Maine. We'll start off with the northernmost station, Brunswick, which is part of a complex, and it's right near Bowdoin Colleges, which is one of the major colleges in Maine and in New England. And then going south, Freeport, where L.L. Bean's headquarters are located, and L.L. Bean co-owns this station. So that's nice that L.L. Bean is supporting train travel. And then I don't have a great shot of the Portland station, but they have a really interesting canopy over the platform. And this is what the station used to look like. Once upon a time, beautiful station that they used to have in Portland. And going south, Old Orchard Beach. And then Saco, Maine, which on the map shares its name with the town of Biddeford. So it's Saco, Biddeford, Maine, modern station. And then this is the last station I'll show in this video, which I thought was an interesting station and a nice way to end the, this video in the town of Wells. And I tried to find out who designed it, and I don't know whether an architect with Maine DOT designed it or if they contracted out to an outside firm, but it almost appears, I don't know if it's intentional, but it appears to be almost Asian influenced. So anyway, it's an interesting station. So that's it for all the stations and lines in the eastern U.S. and representative a lot of states that have good train service and are supporting Amtrak, either with riders or with networks or with subsidies, or all three. So thanks for watching. See you in the next video.